Okay, everybody, welcome to February 2019's Personal Defense Network Live, the PDN Live Show, where we try to be as interactive as possible with our members and our viewers. If you're watching this for free now, I want to encourage you to go to personaleventsnetwork.com and sign up as a, a registered receiver of our newsletter. It's a free newsletter. It's going to alert you to events like this. It's going to alert you to a lot of the new content postings we have, special offers from some of our collaborators and advertisers and things like that. You're also going to be getting regional specific updates through that free newsletter email list about our training tour dates because our training tour launches again in March as usual we'll be hitting about hundred and twenty well as usual last year we hit about hundred and fifteen this year we're up to about hundred and twenty classes but as usual they will be taking place across the country so we'll probably be at about sixty different locations this year I personally will be at about thirty of those locations doing a lot of different types of training but primarily probably about seventy five percent of the training that I do will be live fire defensive pistol oriented whether it's a fundamental intuitive defensive shooting class one of our advanced classes two-person arm defense, home defense uh, tactics, our armed home defense tactics, uh, whatever it may be. The idea is we'll be on a range and we'll be integrating some level of contextually appropriate training and practice methodology with the shooting of a firearm. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So first of all, big 50,000 foot, 100,000 foot view. It's important to remember we're talking about defensive shooting skill development. So we're not just talking about shooting skill in terms of marksmanship. That's really, really going to be important here because we might uh, bust some myths or we might step on some cliches in terms of what you might do if you are only interested in marksmanship as opposed to specifically defensive shooting skill development because this is an applied skill. It's not just a skill performed in isolation. Um, some of your action sports, some of your competitive shooting skills are also skills that are applied in short bursts of application. Um, but marksmanship, the fundamentals of marksmanship, really it's an isolated skill. And some of our competitions, like uh, let's say uh, bullseye shooting, uh, any kind of uh, you know standing there one-handed shooting a pistol and you have some extended period of time uh, to shoot five or six shots. Uh, these types of things are really skills in isolation drills. Um, a qualification course is a, a an application of a skill in some ways, but it is an isolated performance, right? You're told exactly what to do, you hear a whistle or you're told to go, you get the go signal, and then you perform that isolated skill set in a prescribed amount of time to some standard uh, as far as the accuracy. We're going to be talking about applying skills in a way that creates uh, a lot of chaos, right? In that, in that dynamic critical incident we've talked about for, for years here at Personal Defense Network. You've heard that phrase over and over and over again. If you're one of our longtime uh, members or, or viewers, free uh, participants in the online, maybe you go all the way back to 2005 with us with our DVD series. Maybe you're a gold member or a platinum member of Personal Defense Network. You've heard some of this terminology before. So we want to be really specific about defensive shooting. It's important to set that stage beforehand. This phone is connecting me uh, back to our moderator. Our moderator is reading what you guys are putting down there in that chat window. So uh, any specific questions that you have as we go through this, every couple minutes I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a look and uh, see what questions you're asking. I'm going to be pretty picky today. I want to stay very, very specifically focused on this idea of live fire training and how to get the best out of it for defensive shooting skill development. So right away, well, let's talk about sort of the, the, the elephant in the room, and I mentioned it in my, my tease on social media just a few minutes ago when I said we were getting ready to go live. It's going to be, okay, but what about dry fire training? And this is one of the, the biggest questions we get at the end of our live classes. When people say, okay, but like, I may not be able to get to the range or the weather or my range won't let me train realistically, so how can I train this when I'm not at the range? There's a, there's a hard truth coming right now. You can't. Let that settle for a second. There are parts of defensive firearms training, defensive sh shooting, defensive gun handling, that to get a contextually appropriate level of training, you must be out there doing live fire, right? I, I, you guys know, I've been a fan of the CERT Pistol Next Level Training for a long time. Uh, they're sponsors of our Personal Defense Network Training Tour. They're back with us again in 2019. I'm really good friends with these guys. There's a lot of great things that you can do with this, but really learning how to shoot isn't one of them. You can refine your shooting, you certainly can refine your marksmanship, but ultimately, they think about what we're talking about, but the context of defensive shooting, right? So I'm, I'm carrying a firearm concealed, I'm going about my, my business in the public space, something happens, I'm caught off guard, I have all these natural reactions, hopefully, if I'm responding as trained, I'm going to be recognizing what I need to do, I'm going to have to access the firearm from under concealment, get that gun oriented at the target, drive out on the threat, and then place defensively accurate shots into the target while 
dealing with all those natural reactions when I was really thinking about going to the store, going to work, or doing something else. So it's very, very different from the, the training environment, and it's certainly going to be a lot different from just standing here and, and pulling the trigger. Right? I came up uh, during the, an era when, in the 80s, you hear people say things like, you know, you should pull the trigger uh, just dry for, you know, a thousand times or three thousand times or some ridiculously, you know, hyperbolic number for every fire, you, you, uh, every live fire shot that you take at the range. Uh, I think about this advice now and it's, it's just, it's nonsensical. Can I learn what my trigger feels like? Sure. But am I really going to be paying that much attention to what my trigger feels like? When I'm thinking about all that other stuff and I'm driving out and taking those shots, probably not. Do I need to know how to pull the trigger? Absolutely. But in most of our defensive shooting situations, we're not just going to be firing one shot, right? One extremely precise shot. We're going to be firing a rapid multiple shot string of fire. So it really doesn't matter how many times I press this trigger, right? I always say like photons don't have much recoil, right? They're not pushing back on this gun very much. So if I'm not learning to manage recoil between those shots, I may get really overconfident about what I've learned with this gun. So I'm always a big fan of saying, okay, I, I get the idea that we have all these great training tools, whether it's the CERT pistol or, or laser simulators with video and interactive and interactive ranges, simulated ranges where you can get the experience of being on a real range by changing the size of the targets on the screen in front of you. All that can be great for a lot of things, but it's not great for learning how to manage recoil. Can't be done. It's not great for getting the stimulus of, of slide lock to stimulate your reload. So you can recognize that stimulus and get right into your reload response as efficiently as possible. It's not good for those things. And those things are core to being able to apply your skills and, and actually even developing those skills. You have to be out there managing recoil to, to be able to say that you're learning how to shoot a, a multiple shot string of fire. So there are some things you just can't do dry fire. So stay focused on that for, with me as we go through the day, as we go through this hour of, of information that, that, sure, I could get a lot of value with the CERT pistol, but not in the fundamental le level, at the fundamental level of def developing defensive shooting skills. Developing our defensive shooting skills we should do live. We use these guns and these other types of simulators to either get into context that we can't get into to integrate decision making. Maybe we're going to do some unorthodox position stuff where we're going to maybe sit in a chair and uh, think about presenting from our holster from a chair. We can't do that at our range. Um, we don't have, we obviously have a live fireplace we can do at our house, but it's not a great idea to use a live gun when you have something like a CERT pistol. You can use this. There's, there's no way you're going to hurt yourself or anybody else in your home practicing, you know, worst case scenario, home invasion. You're sitting on the couch. The gun's concealed. The gun's on your body. Something happens, you've got to get that gun out while you're on the couch. Practice that with your CERT pistol, right? Because it's, it's 99.99999 the same right out to that first shot that you take. The very first shot that you take, you don't have to worry about recoil management or anything else. So if you set your trigger up properly and if the, the gun that you're using, your training gun, is like your gun, you carry it in the same place, in the same holster, then you do get a lot of value out of that moment of training. But that's not really the shooting. That's the deployment in that unorthodox shooting position. So keep that in mind. When you go to the range, the other side of this coin is then taking your focus and making sure that what you're doing is contextually appropriate. I'm going to just kind of take some notes out here on the side. Let's see, those are notes from last night. If you're a Platinum member, hopefully you got to see our Platinum broadcast uh, last night. I'm just going to make some notes here, get that out of the way. And we're going to talk about okay, context. All right, you guys hear me use this word a lot inside of Personal Defense Network, inside of the Intuitive Defensive Shooting Program. Certainly, I see training company going all the way back to the Valhalla Training Center it was 20 years ago. Contextually appropriate training. So when you're out there on the range, if what you're doing, if you're, if you're thinking about developing defensive shooting skills for concealed carry, but you never practice going from the holster to your fully extended shooting position and firing that rapid string, you're not really doing contextually appropriate training, right? Now, you can't start there. Certainly, we have to start you know, from the ready position. We might have a table, uh, fundamental defensive shooting skills. right? We're going to come from the ready position, move the gun out to our extended shooting position, learn to take a shot. Then we're going to do multiple shots. And then eventually, we're going to go from processing information, where we bury the targets and things like that. And then we're going to go back to the holster, and then we're going to add some simulation of being startled and processing of information. And that gets us a contextually appropriate venue for the, the training. The other thing we want to talk about is the equipment, okay? I want you to make sure that you don't go out to the range with your, your favorite gun if your favorite gun isn't the gun you carry. Now, a lot of people will, I'll see them, they'll even come to classes with a full-size gun even though they carry a compact version of the gun. If what you're doing is carrying, you know, you're shooting a Glock 19, but you carry a Glock 26, 
not that big a difference. If you carry, um, I don't know, a Ruger LCP in a pocket holster, but you show up to the range with a, a SIG P320 X5 with a magwell and a red dot on it and a you know drop leg holster or something, you're, you're really apples and oranges, right? So make sure that you're using the right equipment. Of course, that relates back to the context, right? And then the other thing I want to make sure that you're doing, we'll get to this at the end, is processing information. I want to make sure that you're processing information and tying that to your development of the shooting skills because that's really what bridges the gap between being able to just put holes in the target in an isolated marksmanship way and being able to apply your skills in that defensive moment. Let's see what we got here for questions. I saw a couple had come in. Uh, let's see. Uh, Chad has asked a question that is not on this topic, but Chad, if you're a gold uh, level member with PDN, we are going to be doing an armed home defense tactics class today. Uh, actually, about half an hour after this ends, we're going to jump into the uh, the armed home defense uh, lecture, quick uh, 30 minute class, just for our, our personal defense network gold level membership. And uh, hopefully, all the gold members that are watching this are going to be able to go get some water, eat some lunch, or something, and come back. Uh, we'll be talking about defense, and I can get to your your body armor question there. Um, I've got another question on social media, and it's asking about the, the inside the waistband versus outside the waistband holster. Okay, really, really important question, good topic. So let's talk about that. We talk about context and equipment. Think about everything I've just said, it would make sense. I'm going to open up this quick access area of this save, I think. Yes, perfect. Got that here. Let's do this. I'm going to go back to the cert pistol, and we're going to talk about this outside the waistband holster. If you carry at the, let's say you carry at the four o'clock position, right, and you carry inside the waistband, and there's really not much difference in the mechanics from the, the time I get my hand on the gun, so I've cleared my concealment garment, I've got my hand on the gun, the gun comes up, it orients, it drives out, I'm going to do my shooting, I'm going to assess the environment, and then I'm going to get the gun back into the holster. And when I go to get the gun back into the holster, of course, I need to get my concealment garment out of the way. Preferably, I look, see my, my holster, and then I put the gun back in. There isn't really much difference at all if I use an outside the waistband holster for my live fire training. I'm still coming back to exactly the same place. I'm still coming up. I'm driving out. I'm shooting. I'm assessing. I'm coming back. I'm going to make sure this is out of the way. I see the holster, and I get the gun back into the holster. Obviously, I wouldn't want to put my hand there, but it's, the demonstration is so you see this in the same place. If I carry appendix, all right, let's say that I carry appendix position. So we're going to just put the cert pistol there where I normally carry, <coughs> put this in the, in the, the back at 4 o'clock. If I put this out at the 3 or 4 o'clock position, and I, instead of practicing opening my hip up, clearing my concealment garment, getting my grip on the gun, coming up, flattening the gun out, and then rotating it as I extend, then coming back in, remembering to push that, the hips back out and flag the gun straight back down, especially in a training environment, so I'm not flagging the person next to me that way. If I'm not practicing those moves, if instead I'm practicing the same moves I, I was demonstrating as if I carried on my hip outside or inside the waistband over here, I'm not actually training the right thing. So this gets back to context. What's the most important thing that I can do is train realistically. But if my goal is training realistically, we always talk about safety being the idea of balancing risk and benefit, right? So if I, if I go back over here, we get that out of the way, and we say risk versus benefit. If we look at the risk versus benefit of anything we do out on the we have to look at every all the risk versus benefit of the stuff we do out on the range. Well, reholstering going under layers of clothing, going inside the waistband, especially if you have a, a deep carry holster that's below the top of the belt, below the top of the pants, or if you have a subcompact gun with a very short barrel, if you're carrying a gun that doesn't have a lot of slide and barrel out in front of the, I'll show you what I'm talking about here in case you aren't picturing it. So this gun has an extra inch and a half or so of distance for me to get into a holster right before the trigger starts to get near my clothing as opposed to this gun, this subcompact with a very short barrel where it is going to be much harder to get that front of the gun into the holster top without the trigger being near the clothing and the belt line and all these things, right? So the idea of safety, to me, when we talk about risk versus benefit, if I'm getting 99% of the value of the mechanics of coming from here, or, by the way, I could always wear an outside the waistband holster also in the appendix position. This is something that a lot of people find awkward, 
but there, there's really no reason not to do it for all the same reasons that for decades the training industry has had people for safety and for efficiency have use outside the waistband holsters even if they carry inside over here. We can do the same thing here. So I'm starting to see some more people do this in other classes. We've been doing it for years since we started really seeing a lot more students showing up with appendix carry is we don't say, well, carry over here. Just take your outside the waistband holster or preferably you know, one that is exactly like the holster you use and put it on outside your waistband. You might even sandwich it between the belt and the pant line. So it's, it's not designed to be actually outside because of this, the cant or the drop or the angle. There aren't a lot of holsters that are straight that are made for four or five o'clock outside the waistband. A lot of people have moved from that carry position to appendix. So when they, they grab that holster out of the old box to the bottom of the closet, it's, it's set up awkwardly to practice appendix carry because the cant is off. As you can see, it would be with this particular holster. So I wouldn't want to use this one here. But if I can get 99% of the value in the mechanics, without the elevated risk, and by the way, the elevated time, which just takes more time, effort, and energy to safely get the gun back in the holster when you have to move all the concealment garments out of the way, then I'm going to do that. And as we get into more contextual uh, challenge, as we get into scenarios, um, when, with the CERT pistol, when you're, you're inside your home or workplace practicing, if you go to one of the laser simulators, when you're doing non-lethal training ammunition, powered training, the marking cartridge with you know, protective equipment and role players and scenarios in those environments, Absolutely, go all the way. Make sure that you're, you're concealed and your clothing is appropriate to the way you normally dress and you're doing everything as close to real as possible because that's the whole point of the simulation or the scenario. But when we're doing fundamental defensive shooting skill, I don't think it's a big deal to go outside the waistband in exactly the same position that you would normally carry inside the waistband. Of course, you can still cover it up with a shirt or a jacket as you move through uh, your, your more advanced skill development. Think about this though, a lot of people say, well, if it's not concealed, it's not real. The problem I have with the idea that if it's not concealed, it's not real, is that most people I know don't wear exactly the same clothing all the time. Right? So you dress a certain way for work, you dress a certain way when you're shopping, you dress a certain way when you go to the park, you dress a certain way when you're sitting around your house. And those different types of clothing, whether it's a tucked in shirt, whether it's a jacket that you sweep back, a suit like a suit jacket or a sports coat, if it's a, a tucked shirt that's a dress shirt, which is very close to the body as opposed to maybe a little bit looser, just kind of you can have some, some bagginess here to grab with a more casual shirt. Maybe it's an untucked shirt, maybe it's a hoodie, maybe it's a, a snap shirt that can, can rip open very easily to get to your gun when it's carried at the three or the four or the five o'clock uh, inside the waistband. And then we got the heavy coat. So in the winter, now you're outside, you've got a heavy coat on versus a light jacket or maybe no jacket. Uh, for women, uh, dresses and skirts versus uh, jeans versus pants with a belt, yoga pants without a belt, a lot of different ways people carry. And then, of course, the, the tops also change for the women as well. So what I'm saying is you can, for the sake of checking a box and saying, yeah, I, I'm definitely practicing from concealment all the time, go to the range with an old hoodie and always be drawing from concealment when you're getting your practice. But if you wear suits 30 days a year, if you wear suits 30% of your time when you're at work, if you sometimes wear heavy jackets, if you live in a, in a temperate climate where there's a huge swing in temperature, maybe during the day, like here in Colorado, where we can wake up in the morning and it's in the negatives and we get up uh, and it's in the 40s in the afternoon, so we go from really bundled up to uh, in the middle of the day, we might be down to just a, a lightweight hoodie or a lightweight jacket or just even a long sleeve t-shirt. You know, in the humidity, you deal with uh, down at the coast, if you're down in Florida or you're out in California, you may have a more consistent temperature at any given point of the year, but you still may have a great variation from August to January. So the idea that because you are concealed in some way, you're getting 100% of the contextual benefit, I think that's flawed as well. So, so understand why we're, we're in the realm of, of quite often seeing students in our videos, in our classes, even those, uh, those of you who are doing the interactive platinum classes, you're seeing students outside the waistband for the most part because you're getting most of the training. Um, save the, the highest level of reality for when you're really doing simulations and scenarios, and that's when you're probably not going to be live fire anyway. Again, what can I do dry fire? What can I do with the cert pistol? Well, one of the things I can do is practice from concealment in my actual clothes, in my home, or in my workplace. You, know, you might, if you don't own your workplace, you want to make sure that everybody knows what you're doing. Uh, but, but make sure that you're thinking about the, the one-to-oneness of the value of that concealed training. If you're not actually wearing the real clothes or the real holster, you may not be getting as much reality as, as you're hoping for out on the range. Uh, let's see what else we got here. What type of competition? So this is this is a question. I don't know. I don't know if it comes up every time, but it comes up most of the time. Almost every class, almost every discussion we have about uh, how to get practice, how to get realistic training, 
is what about competition shooting? So I'm gonna, yeah, if you've been following, you've heard this before, but it's worth hearing again because the question keeps coming up, right? When people stop asking this question, I'll stop giving this answer. But here's the deal. I have a lot of people tell me that they get into, let's say, like IDPA. They say, oh, I'm going to get into IDPA because that's the, the time that the range is really, you know, varied. We have different types of targets, and it, it's some stress, and it's the only time my range lets me, you know, move to a shooting position. It's the only time my range lets me draw from the holster and shoot rapidly or any of those things. I think that, by the way, is less and less true. I've started to get um, a little bit more aggressive about policing that, that cliche or that conventional wisdom online because I'm on you know, 40 or 50 ranges a year in the U.S., and I'm starting to find it hard to find this range where people can't draw from the holster. Now, there may be a special class you have to take first. You may have to be on a certain range. You may only be certain days of the week. But I'm, I'm, it's hard for me now to find an actual range where it is actually true that they do not allow presentation from the holster. Um, obviously, if I'm there teaching, they're allowing presentation from the holster, at least when I'm there, which makes me think they're also going to allow other instructors to do it. And if they're already opening that door, then all the things you hear about insurance or the rules or the, the covenants or the board or whatever, that, that can't actually be true, right? So there has to be some condition under which you can get your range to evolve a little bit um, if they are one of those ranges where that you really can't draw from the holster. So let's, let's put that aside, first of all. Next thing is, so you're going to IDPA. You're going to practice your defensive shooting skills. Well, here's here's what I always ask. Where are you, like, coming in on the score? You know, because usually the kind of people that come to my classes, they, they, they pay a lot of money for, for the tuition, they pay a lot of money for the ammo, they uh, probably travel, they have to take some days off work maybe, or at least days away from the family. They're making an investment. They're probably not true beginners. And if they're both people at the class and they're people who are wanting to get an IDPA, they're probably on the, the upper side of there's the skill ability, right? The average gun owner is certainly up above that, and even maybe above the average concealed carry owner as a group, or concealed carry uh, permit holder as a, as a group. So if you think about that, they're probably pretty good, right? Relative to the average guy, right? That was what one would hope. So if you ask them, where are you on the score sheet at the end of the day? You know, are you in the top 10%? Are you in the top 25%? Or are you in the bottom half? Or maybe are you even in the bottom 25%? And I don't always let them answer, right, because they kind of, it gives them pause, they want to think about it, I think they know it's maybe a trick question, and it is in a certain way, because here's what I think. If you go to an IDPA match, and you're going to tell me that you're practicing your defensive shooting skills, well then, what, what I want to see is, you're going to carry the gun the way you normally carry it, right? You're going to say, well, IDPA doesn't allow appendix carry, I don't think that's changed yet, so okay. Right away, you're not actually practicing your defensive shooting skills if you actually carry in the appendix position, but you go to IDPA. Now, if you could go to them and say to the guys, listen guys, I'm really only here for practice and training. I, I don't care if I come in last, you can give me an a inappropriate like, penalty for gear worn improperly or whatever at every stage and I'll lose, but is it okay if I do this? Maybe they'll say yes, right? What do you care? Because you're there for training, not for competition, right? Let's take that out of the equation. Let's say that you carry back here at the four or five o'clock. Okay, so you carry at the four or five o'clock, but you carry a uh, subcompact XD Mod 2, or you carry a Glock 26. But now you're out there, you say, well, you look at the divisions list, and you know, those guys with that, I'm going to do this, I want to be in this division, so I'm going to carry my full size gun. Uh, well, guess what? Once again, you're not getting your training that you told me you wanted for IDPA. You're now doing the competition, right? Um, let's say this, okay. So the buzzer goes off, right? What do you, what do you, I don't know where your hand starting position is, whatever it is, you, you're in your starting position and the buzzer goes off and you reach for your gun. But if you're training in our model, you're doing counter ambush training, so you're integrating a, a simulation of startle reaction. So when the buzzer goes off, you should be doing this as if the first target startled you and then going for your gun. You're gonna say, but Rob, that's gonna slow me down. I'm gonna, they're gonna laugh at me and they're gonna make fun of me and it's gonna slow me down, so I'm gonna get a worse score. I don't care, because you said you were there for defensive skill development and training and practice, not to win. So you see where I'm going, right? If you draw your gun and you double tap, swing, double tap, swing, double tap, because that's what the rules say you can do, but you're not training for double taps in the real world, right? I mean, it's not 1985. You're, you're training for multiple rounds swings of fire, right? Like three to five or four to six, assessing, oh, there's another target, three to five, four to six, a different number of shots. There's another target. Right? Because I have to find another target. I don't magically know where all the targets are in the real world, so I'm not just going to swing through them. I'm actually going to break my gun back towards the ready position, right? assess, simulate, oh, there's another threat driving out. Well, that's going to add a lot of time, and I'm going to have more shots than I need on the targets. Yeah, you are. So that's how I answer that question. IDPA 
stages and the environment of IDPA, especially going back 20 years ago when there were many ranges that were much more strict about members or just open shooting bays allowing presentation from Ulster. Because remember, we had, you know, what, a handful of, uh, of millions, or three, four million, two million in the 80s, three, four, five, six million in the 90s, growing to where now we have well over 30 million people in the country who can actually carry concealed legally, right? About uh, half of that number is permits and half of that number is people who could own firearms in the states that are now constitutional carry. So we've seen a, a tenfold in the last 20 some years increase in the number of people who can carry a gun in the U.S. Obviously that means the ranges have been forced to have their customer base allowed to use the holsters out on the ranges too. So I, I don't really buy into the, <clears throat> that idea and understand why I think, yeah, IDPA can be great if you use it well. If you're actually playing the game and you're winning plaques and stuff, it's not that it's going to get you killed in the streets, it's that you could be spending all that time, effort, and energy doing actual defensive training. The last thing I'll say on that is, if you want to do competitive shooting because it's fun, because you want to win, because you're good at it, to hang out with your buddies, to impress the ladies, or impress the men, or whatever, cool, do it. But don't tell yourself it's defensive practice because you could get better defensive practice with the same investment of time, effort, energy, money in the gear and all the time and ammo and all that stuff just doing actual defensive practice. So that's important. Uh, let's see. Drills for somebody who's new to concealed carry. Um, absolutely. And in fact, one of the reasons I have the, the magic screen open here is so that we can do just that. Because I wanted to, to show you this. Let's say that I just go over here and I type in, I'm just going to step off the camera for a second and type in drills, and let's just see what comes up. I kind of like doing this um, right here. Well, shooting drills, this is a drill for the recognition of, of the condition of your gun. It's more of a home defense drill. The take a lap drill, take a lap drill is, is actually really good for a couple of different things. One of the things the take a lap drill does is it allows you to practice that, that multiple target engagement, right? The, the taking your shots, when you get your hit, that threat's taken care of. Now I'm going to come back and assess the environment, find the next threat, engage that next threat. So it's a multiple target engagement drill. Um, you can do it a couple of different ways. Um, probably the way that we show that one, it's dealing with a higher level of precision. You can do it as a, as a full upper body uh, chest shot target also, and if you get your multiple shot strings of fire in there. Um, multiple ports drill. So this drill, if people see um, the shooting port. I'm going to go ahead and bring that one up real quick and let you guys see what we're talking about here. Um, if you can see that, that port, I don't know if I can zoom in. Yeah, there we go. So you can kind of see that port right there and get an idea of what I'm doing. Well, you probably don't have like diamonds and triangles and squares cut out of the walls in your, your workplace or your home. And in fact, if you go out in the public space, you're, you're not going to see that either uh, very often. So I, I think in the old days, I, like the impression people had was this was some kind of like war zone that you're in where there's like, you know, big mortar rounds have gone through, have gone off and blown holes in the wall or, or you know, big 20 millimeter rounds or 50 cal rounds have blown holes in the wall and you're now defending it. That's not what this is, okay? What this is, imagine a three-dimensional environment, right? Imagine a, an environment like shooting across your home if you have like an open floor plan that lets you go through, uh, across some of the kitchen and, and across some of the living room. If there was a bad guy kind of coming around a corner, there may be a situation where you have to shoot like over the island uh, or maybe the, the shelf area in your kitchen with a, like a toaster on it or you know, just the mailbox, the little thing where you throw your keys, whatever it is. You've got to shoot over that, but you've got to shoot under uh, the light fixture that comes up over the couch. And you've got to shoot to the left of the wall, uh, but the, the target's only out about four or five inches beyond that wall. Well, that's what gives you this simulated port idea here. Right? Oh, let's turn it off. That simulated port. So the idea of the, the why are we practicing shooting through ports isn't in case you end up with an actual port situation. The reason we're doing it that way is in case you end up needing to shoot through a three-dimensional environment and you've got boundaries at the top and bottom of the area. So that can be a, a good drill. Um, the rhythm drill from Chris Collins of ATAP. I was just talking to him um, last week. Rhythm drill is, is a drill which helps you with your consistent volume of fire, as does the volume of fire drill. So Kind of circling back, one that I wanted to show you, there is a huge collection of defensive shooting drills, live fire drills at Personal Defense Network. Some of these go way back. This figure eight drill video, um, that is probably that was probably filmed in 2005, is my guess. So we're going almost 15 years there. Um, that uh, video with Chris is probably about five or six years ago. 
and uh, this recognition of condition drill we did, I think that was out in Arizona, probably just a couple of years ago. So there's, there's a huge collection of videos here that, that span a long period of time. And these drills vary, right? Some of them will say that they're advanced drills. You'll see a lot of the advanced drills will be available only to our premium members, our higher level of membership, because why would we want to put that more advanced drill right out there uh, kind of for the person who may never have gone out and shot before. It becomes a risk and benefit issue, right? So if I'm looking for drills that are really good for fundamental development, um, you're going to go to the videos online here where we talk about teaching a new shooter fundamental defensive shooting skills, getting someone started in defensive shooting skills, and you'll see very quickly we move through that, I just kind of talked about it earlier, a single shot, multiple shot in isolation. Then we start integrating decision making. That's going to be really important. So a balance of speed and precision drill that integrates decision making. It requires a, a random uh, command of some kind. A training partner would be great uh, to use. You can just, you know, take a make a video uh, on your phone real quick, of, you know, six minutes or three minutes or whatever of you giving some commands. Make three or four videos and just kind of don't look. Hit one of them. Hit play. Put it down on the, the barrel or the table at the range and let it start giving you commands spaced out. You know, every. Uh, 8 to 12 seconds if you're going from the holster, maybe every uh, 5 to 7 or 8 seconds if you're going from the ready position. That will give you time to hear the command, process it, find the right target, engage the target, come back in, assess, and wait for the next command. Or obviously with a training partner, it's an even better way to do it. So that can be a great way to get started. If you're past the, the basics of recognizing slide lock for reloads, getting the gun out of the holster, managing recoil uh, you know, out to let's say 25, 30 feet, you know how fast you can shoot multiple shot strings to hit the high center chest three, four, or five times, uh, getting headshots out to 25, 30 feet. If you've kind of mastered all of those things, the next thing to do is to start doing things like the volume of fire drill. That can be a great one. Um, getting in, even into the defensive shooting standards drill, um, defensive shooting standards drill was a, an attempt, a lot of people ask questions over the years, you know, well, Rob, what if you, you had to have a standards drill? So I always kind of, you know, denigrate the, the standards that are, that are made up. People say, well, they're objective. Well, they're not really objective, right? Somebody made up the scores, they made up the course of fire, and they, they said, okay, you have to do this within six seconds to get a silver star. If you do it within four seconds, I'll give you a gold star, and uh, you get a free hat or something if you do it in less than, than three seconds. That's all made up, right? So it, it can't be catered or tailored to your potential. And the defensive shooting standards drill is one that, that definitely allows you to, to work within a structure and maybe even compare your score today to your score yesterday or compare scores with somebody else. Usually it's going to be an average of those scores because there are some important variables we have to throw in if we're going to do contextually appropriate training. And uh, when you see that defensive standards drill, you'll see how that works. But that's a good one for the evaluation of your ability to apply your defensive shooting skills. So we're a little bit more than halfway through. Um, if you have a question or you think about uh, going and typing it in there on, under our actual chat window there uh, at PDN, the uh, social media has asked a couple questions. But first, I want to remind you guys that um, I talked earlier about the free newsletter and I've alluded to our different levels of membership. A um, couple of reasons why you want to look at the other levels of membership. The first one, the easy one, is the premium membership. Uh, when you first come to Personal Events Network and you surf around a little bit, if, if you find value, if you find a video or, or 12 worth watching, which you probably will, there's, there's literally... Um, if we go to the videos list, I don't know how many pages we're up to here, but um, let's see. There's a. We look down here. We go to the latest videos, view all. This is uh, page one of 121. So we have 121 pages in the video section for you to go through. And uh, a lot of them are going to be premium, uh, but. The majority of them, over 50%, are free videos. You can watch the whole thing. There's a three-minute one. There's a seven-minute one. There's a five-minute one. Um, you can go through. There's another premium one. There's a free one again. Now you can you can see you go through there. Over 50% of the content at Personal Events Network is available to you for free. But obviously, that premium content, if, if you've gone through and you found five, 10, 20 videos that you liked, you found a few videos worth sharing, you've been using PDN for the course of a, a few days or a few weeks, I, I promise you, you're, you're not going to regret it. If you're still there after the first handful of videos, you're not going to regret going to premium level membership and getting access to more content. The gold level and platinum levels, those are really about uh, discounts. Um, we do have the, the different training uh, that's available online. We have our online classes, right? And we have the interactive training now at the platinum level. And inside of our shop, we have a lot of streaming videos that can be downloaded. Obviously, there aren't very many people that are still you know, buying DVDs, but we have a lot of people who are downloading our DVD content in the form of streaming video that they can watch online or even download the full videos and have those 
uh, on your computer, on your hard drive, whatever you want. Um, obviously, you can watch those on your phone. You can watch those on your tablet. If you have your smartphone out at the range, now you could be watching the tutorials, watching the videos right out there as well, and going through those classes. Um, some of our online classes at PDN Academy include information like medical training from Caleb Causey at Lone Star Medics. We've got some knife information from Alessandro Padovani at uh, Safer Faster Defense. So there's more than just the shooting drills, and those classes do go into a lot more depth. They also have PDF downloads and things like that. When you become a gold member or a platinum member, you're going to get some of those classes for free, and you're going to have a significant discount on the rest of those classes that you decide to take or any other downloads from our store. So keep that in mind. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, there are private uh, special online events for each level of membership above uh, premium for gold and for platinum. And we've also got a, a private discussion area for the gold level members on Facebook where people can ask questions and, and interact. And sometimes I'll jump in there, the other instructors will jump in there and try to stimulate some conversation and again, make sure that you're aware of the special events that are coming up. So there are some uh, benefits and, and privileges to uh, getting in on that membership. Let me go back to social media and see what we got. Um, I've got a okay. So a question about how many rounds is is where is there a diminishing return on investment if you go to a practice session and you just blast a lot of rounds? Yes, obviously there is going to be if you're just blasting a lot of rounds. People will ask me how how many rounds they should practice with per month or per year or whatever. And again, it's kind of a made up number because I don't know your resources, you know your budget. Um, I don't I don't know where you are on the the skill level development train, so to speak. So the general concept of advice that I give starts with um, one important area here. Let me call this back up. Hopefully you guys have all that stuff in your brain already. I'm going to give you this piece. Front load your practice. Okay, front loading your practice. And you can, you can run that through a search engine too. You'll find more information on this concept of front loading your practice. Front loading your practice means that when you've learned a new skill, it's really important to practice it at a, at a relatively high level, uh, high volume, high frequency, close to the time that you learn it. If you learn a skill, and even if you've learned it very, very well, but then you walk away from it, uh, you're going to have problems at even remembering potentially how to do what it is you're supposed to be practicing, right? And you're really relearning. If you take a long time off, you're relearning that skill. One of the examples I use is people talk about, you know, it's like riding a bike, right? You never forget how to ride a bike. Well, the reason that cliche exists is because there was a, a period of time in our country for, for a large amount, a large portion of the population in suburban America where the population of children learned how to ride bikes in their, their young years, their toddler, you know, into their grammar school years, and they rode their bikes a lot, right? It was, it was a staple of, of, you know, kind of middle schooler and grammar school uh, lifestyle, right? I, I rode a uh, pedal bike very little because of where I grew up. Um, I wasn't in an environment um, after the age of seven to, to ride a pedal bike for the rest of my life, right? But from the ages of like five, six, seven years old, I rode pedal bike constantly. I'd bike to school, I'd bike around the neighborhood to see my aunts, go out, play with friends, whatever it was. So I had that front loading of the practice that so many people have had in the past, and, and I'm sure still getting today, of pedal biking. So you learn how to pedal bike, you practice it a lot every day after school and all summer long and on the holidays whenever you can, whenever weather allows, you're out there on your bike, then yeah, you can go five years, 10 years, 15 years, and it will take a little bit of time to get used to it again, but it will come back to you because you front loaded your practice. If you never had that experience, if you went bicycling once, you know, you went on a, you lived in a country, grew up on a farm, didn't pedal bike, you went to visit your cousins in the city, they put you on a bike, and on Saturday you were wibbly wobbly, on Sunday you were having a great time, and you never did it again, well, 10 years later, you're probably not going to be very good on a bike, and you're basically relearning the skill. So what I warn people about in, in a class is that they come to class, they learn their skills, and they say, yeah, I'm going to, I just, you know, I used up all my ammunition, so I, I'm going to wait a couple months, get my stockpile back up, and I'm going to get really serious about training in May or something, right? and practicing in May. It's too long, right? So I, I always tell people, you know, you come to a class, we tell you bring a thousand rounds, we say actually, you know, a thousand to twelve hundred rounds. If you bring twelve hundred and we only shoot nine hundred and fifty seven, good. Because now I know you got at least two hundred and forty three that you can go practice with right away without having to spend any more money, make any more trips to the store or anything else. Right? And you just practice with that ammunition, you just trained with that ammunition. We know it works in your gun, great. You can use that left over to go practice. Because it's very, very important that you practice quickly after 
you have learned something. So if you have a, a thousand rounds for the rest of your year after you, you take a class and learn some things, I want you to use you know, the vast majority of them in that first six months. In fact, I probably want you to use about half of them in that first couple of few months after the training and then slow your practice down to the point where you get to maintenance. You might be doing most of your maintenance on something like the cert pistol, right? Now, as I have acclimated to what recoil feels like, what the stimulus of slide lock feels like for my reloads and all that stuff. Now I can imagine some of that stuff and integrate it because I have a real frame of reference from all the live fire I've actually done. I can imagine what effect that's going to have on my rate of fire. I can imagine the stimulus of slide lock. I don't, instead of saying I'm going to shoot three times and reload, I can shoot, 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 imagine feeling slide lock and get my reload started, right, with the surface. Well, imagine racking the slide because I know what it actually feels like to rack the slide. If I hadn't practiced that a lot, I might insert and grab the gun up here and just pretend, or I might insert and just kind of tap at it and hope it goes. But I know what it feels like to rack the slide. So I can simulate this even though the slide doesn't reciprocate on the cert pistol because I front loaded my practice. So as time goes on, I need less and less rounds per month or rounds per year to maintain my, my level of, of skill, my expertise with uh, my defensive shooting skills. So front load your practice is far more important than the volume of practice. Um, let's see here. Um, this question came in. Okay. So. Um, I'll give you a couple of them. So let me do this one. Someone says, any suggestions on one hand failure? Uh, my left hand is occupied with a cane 90% of the time. So you can definitely look um, here uh, online at the one-handed reload stuff that we have, the emergency gun handling stuff that we have, um, shooting while injured uh, information at PDN. Mike Seeklander actually did a great DVD with us. Um, man, going back, it was probably 2009, 10, somewhere in that era. He did uh, a whole DVD we, we take together at uh, U.S. Uh, Shooting Academy, USSA, in Tulsa, just outside of Tulsa, all on one-handed shooting. That included one-handed reloads, one-handed malfunctions, all kinds of stuff, weak hand, strong hand, whatever. So if you're on a cane, we actually have a cane defense uh, DVD too, so if you're on a cane all the time, hopefully you've seen that information. So I've got this gun here, it's locked open, there's no magazine, there's no ammo, any of that. So double checked it, had you guys check it. Let's say that I get to slide lock and I'm on a cane. Well, I've got a couple of things going on here. First of all, if, if you can balance without moving, well, then maybe the best thing for you to do is to go ahead and, and drop the cane and get into your reload with a two-handed reload. If, uh, especially if, let's say, you're behind cover or something like that, right? So you're, you're here behind cover, you're, you're leaning on the cane, you're doing your shooting, you come back, maybe the thing to do is drop the magazine, you know, hook the cane on a pocket or on your belt, uh, just lean it up against your leg, get your magazine, do your reload, and then get back onto the cane. And as I said, we've, we've done a lot with cane defense over the years, so integrating the cane into shooting, I've had plenty of students on the range who've had canes uh, or even walkers uh, out on the range, and we've thought, thought about how to do this. So while that may sound a little like easy for you to say, Rob, um, if you get some reps on that, that might be the easiest and best thing. But if you really do have to do a one-handed reload, um, again, just follow the instructions online. We've got the, the, all of the steps, right? You're going to drop the magazine. You're going to uh, find your holster, you're going to reholster. If you can't get to your holster, you're going to find a pocket to put the gun in. You're going to come across wherever you keep your spare magazine. Now, if you know that you're going to be reloading one-handed because you're on a cane all the time, instead of keeping your magazine on the weak side, probably you'd stage your spare magazine on your strong side. So now you go right back to the holster, you find that magazine, you insert, make sure it's inserted firmly, get that out, and then drive down and rack the slide on your holster, on your belt, uh, come back up to the ready position and drive out and shoot if you need to. So uh, more detail will be available there. As far as your malfunction drills, we also teach the one-handed uh, versions of the non-diagnostic linear malfunction drill as well. Um, typically practice uh, scenarios between 12 and 15 feet. What other realistic distances? Well, here, here's, oh, here's the thing. Um, let me do this. Give you some numbers here. And... We'll look at this. This will be fun. Use this thing. This is an orange. So nine to fifteen feet is something like eighty-five-ish, all right, plus minus percent of our defensive shootings. All right. So something is actually a little over eighty-five percent. And and the book. Um, I don't know if I have a copy of my counter ambush book. Yeah. So if you can find a copy of this counter ambush book, I know that um, Echo 5 Training um, just put a bunch of these up online. Um, a lot of this information about the context uh, of how you should train is, is here. 
Um, it's also in our counter ambush online class inside of the training area, uh, inside of the, the PDN Academy area at the personaleventsnetwork.com website. You can get all this information there as well. Uh, 85 plus percent, according to the best data set I have, and I always go back to, to Tom Gibbons' data set, um, is, a, is a great data set. He's, he's collected a lot of good information and he's collected it consistently over a long period of time over what I think is, a, is an appropriate demographic for, for people that are PDN members or take our classes. So I use that number. The rest of it, the less than 15 percent that is the rest of it, you're going to see, you know, four to five percent are going to be inside, you know, less than uh, nine, is that right? Yeah, less than nine feet. You're going to see uh, something like five to six percent are going to be 16 to 21 feet. And then you're going to see another, you know, whatever it is, four to five percent out here at 22 feet plus. So when you look at those numbers, it's really obvious that your 12 to foot, 15 foot range that you practice at most of the time is, is probably exactly where you need to be practicing at most of the time. Now inside of two arms reach, once you get to where you're, you're coming inside of two arms reach, we refer to that as extreme close quarters, right? So close quarters is this 9 to 15 feet. Uh, extreme close quarters is when someone could reach out and knock the gun out of your hand or very quickly lunge forward and either you know, cut your arm or cut any part of your body with a knife, grab the gun, anything like that. So inside of two arms reach is a whole different beast. It's, it, it's an advanced uh, skill set that I think you have to be really strong in your gun handling and your, your knowledge of coming in and out of the holster and all that. You probably should have some awareness of your, your close quarters fighting, your striking, your grappling type skills. And you want to put those two things together in your extreme close quarters retention shooting, um, shooting while in contact. Again, blocks of instruction available at PDM. But this is an area where I really encourage people to go out and train with someone uh, super, in a supervised way that can train this well. Somebody uh, you know, under the ICE banner, or, uh, the PDN or ICE banner that's teaching extreme close quarters tactics. Somebody under the ShivWorks banner that's teaching uh, extreme close quarters concepts is what they use as the terminology. But there, there aren't a lot of people out there that I think are doing this really, really well um, in an integrated way. So those are the resources you want to look for there. Um, kind of hard to practice on your own. Three-dimensional targets help. Using the cert pistol, using marking cartridges, those are probably the best ways to train a lot of your compressed things outside of a supervised training class. Um, 16 to 21 feet, it should be part of you know day one, right? If you're going to carry a gun, especially in the public space, you should be able to hit high center chest targets out to 21 feet without a problem. You should be able to go beyond that and get even into this last 5% without any problem hitting the high center chest targets um, out to you know, 35, 40 feet should be considered a fundamental basic level of skill when it comes to defensive shooting if you're going to carry a gun out in public. So you should be trained and learn what this feels like, but you don't need to spend uh, an equal amount of time, for example, at, at 21 feet as you do at 15 feet. It wouldn't make any sense according to the data, the contextually appropriate data that we have. One thing you want to be careful of is you want to be careful of people will lump, will lump these two together, right? And they'll say, well, you know, 90%, right? 90% happen between 9 and 21 feet. And, and here's the problem with that. It, a, it's a little disingenuous, right? It kind of skews the data to favor that magic 7-yard line or 21-foot line, which, which was so uh, sort of popular and important in, the, in our training in the 80s and into the 90s. Most classes have realized we need to move the line closer. The other thing is when you see thousands of people shoot in the context of defensive shooting skill development, people shoot a lot differently at 12 feet than they do at 20. All right, the pace of shooting is dramatically different. Even the, the, the way they train with their body, it's much more visceral and athletic and real up close uh, mentally. If they back up and they tend to relax their bodies a little bit. So that training discipline issue, you're going to train more. I, guess what? If you're being shot at at 20 feet, I bet you're going to be pretty tense and athletic, right? But it doesn't necessarily carry that urgency when you're shooting at a slower pace. Um, sighted versus unsighted fire. Most people are able to get consistent hits on the high center chest body targets. Um, up here at 9 to 15 feet, especially that 9 to 12 feet area without using their sights at all with no focus on them whatsoever. So it's important to have the distinction between that and moving back to where at least half the people in our classes definitely need to close an eye and focus on their sights to do sighted fire when they're trying to hit that high center chest uh, around the 20, 21 foot mark. And certainly when we get out to 30, 35, 40 feet, almost everybody's referencing their sights in, at some level in some way cognitively. It's all we worry about. If you're not focused on your sights, it's unsighted. If you are focused on your sights, it's sighted. And we draw kind of a hard line there. And for most people, that line starts to develop past the 15 foot mark out towards that, that 20 or just beyond 20 feet. So it's, it's important to, to 
keep doing what you're doing, 12 to 15 feet. That's where we're going to do, you know, 60% of our training in a, in a two-day course is probably going to be in that 12 to 15 foot range. We will get outside of that. We only go inside of it, inside of two arms reach, in those specific classes uh, designed to cover that, that coursework, that, that extreme close quarter shooting. So let's see what we got here. Um, well, PDN, so Jason asked, Jason, I'm glad you asked that. Let's, let's check that out for a second. Let me get my scratch out of the way. Will PDN ever do training courses in Massachusetts, Vermont, or Maine? Um, I'm not sure. Literally, it's like, what is it? It's Tuesday, and at some point this week, we're supposed to be getting some updates on our tour dates and locations. Um, and it looks like it hasn't been updated, but um, we do have, what, New Hampshire. So that's right up in that area. Um, not one of the places you listed, but it's kind of right in between the Vermont and the Maine, right? So we have New Hampshire on here. I know Massachusetts is going to be added to this list for me, for sure. I'll be back. I always do courses in Massachusetts every year to support the Gun Owners Action League. I'll be there in the fall to support them. We do a week of training as a fundraiser for that uh, gun rights organization. I will be there as part of the tour. I'll be at Cape Gunworks uh, down in Hyannis. I'll be in Massachusetts for that. I'm not sure if we're going to get a Vermont class on the schedule for the tour this year, um, but I do love training up there. Um, where I am in Keene, New Hampshire, I'll be there in the, the spring tour, and I'll also be back in the fall again for the Live Free or Die event. Um, I'll be at least running a couple sessions there. And where else? Yes, Maine. I'll tell you what, I need to train in Maine. Maine is one of the only states that I've never trained in. In fact, there's two states left that I have not taught in, Maine and Hawaii. So uh, I actually did speak to someone who manages uh, training uh, on a range in Maine, uh, at the Live for Your Die event, so hopefully um, you will see a class from me sometime this year. It probably won't be on the spring tour, it'll probably be in the fall up in Maine, so I can finally check the box on that. But point being, yes, I will be in New England, uh, so join us up there, Jason. And that was my opportunity to share with all of you uh, the tour training pages. Under the training tab, you hit training dates and locations, and you're going to see that calendar. As I said, you said just my classes right now. Um, a lot of the other guys are, are contributing instructors I mentioned earlier. Their courses will be added to that list. They're you know, sort of going from the emails been sent to the IT tech guys make it show up on the page. That's the process where that is. Our tour launches on March 23rd. So we always like to try to get those courses, many of the courses up as we can by March 1st. So that's uh, one of the tasks on the table for Personal Defense Network this week. Um, let's see here. Um, we got about three minutes left, and some of that stuff there is redundant. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, the importance of, of having the right gun. Before you can really, before you should really invest a whole bunch of time, effort, and energy in the developing of your skill, you should settle on an appropriate carry gun for yourself. I, I hear some people say things like, you know, it doesn't matter what you learn with, just go out and learn to shoot and then you can pick your gun. And maybe even to some extent you'll be a more educated consumer after you've learned the skills. There is definitely value in familiarization with a lot of different guns. In fact, one of the things I'll tell people to do is go to a rental range and you know try three or four or five different guns out and see which ones fit your hand best, which ones feel the best, which ones you know you like the trigger on, whatever. Even if you're an uneducated consumer, you can tell yourself, okay, within this range, I'm going to look and figure out what feels good. But setting those boundaries is really important. So check out once again online. Check out all the information we published on selecting a defensive firearm or what types of defensive pistols or pistols are best suited for personal defense. Don't go into the gun shop and sort of look at everything. Because I can tell you right now, it's sort of a, as a there's a, a predictable phenomenon that's going to happen. The gun that you're going to shoot best, I will say, you know, I've been in this interview for a couple decades, watched a lot of new shooters, seen a lot of people on the range, and had a lot of people explain to me how they end up owning guns or even carrying guns that aren't great for personal defense, is, but I shoot it so well. And that's really the downside. Let's go full circle back now. Where did we start? Right? Almost an hour ago, we started with me saying, this is not about marksmanship. It's not just about shooting skill. So if the only metric you use to choose your defensive shooting gun, your defensive carry gun, or your gun you're going to stage at home in the quick access safe, the only metric you use is, well, which gun do I shoot the best? You're not going to come to the right conclusion because that's not oh, the only thing we're worried about. We're worried about a whole bunch of things other than just marksmanship. So the gun you shoot the best at the range may not be at all the gun that you should carry or the gun you should stage for defense. So you got to set the range, and obviously we recommend modern striker-fired pistols, things like uh, the guns you've seen me pick up here. you got the, the Glock, the XD, the M&P. Um, there's some great modern striker-fired guns from other companies. Now the VP9, I see a lot of those in classes. Uh, the CZ uh, P-Series, the, the new P10S, uh, I think it's called. The configuration looks great. 
uh, the FN, uh, the, the um, FN's offering the uh, 509. Uh, they now have a compact version of that gun or a mid-size version of that gun anyway. So there, there's a lot of options out there that are modern striker fired guns. No external safeties, um, three to five pound triggers, moderate trigger travel distance, uh, polymer frame, uh, comfortable guns to carry, relatively lightweight, um, capacity varies with the size and shape. I like to see a four inch barrel or longer in most of the carry guns. Even the single stack subcompact guns, I carry the XDS four inch right now. Um, there are other guns out there, the new uh, Glock uh, 48, the new 10 round single stack Glock comes in just over four inches long. Uh, the Glock 19 uh, is in that same area. So when you find the gun uh, out of the range of guns that are appropriate for defensive carry, that's when you want to start looking at the gun that fits your hand the best, the gun you're going to be able to carry the best, and all those things. Uh, I'll warn you that the, the you know, a lot of people have said this uh, over the years to justify really bad decisions, like you know a, a pocket 32 caliber gun or a 22 you know single action revolver built into a uh, wallet holster or something. So well, I'd rather have that than nothing. I get it. I understand what you're saying, but. If you're going to bother to carry a gun, if you're going to bother to go through the, the, the time, effort, energy, the responsibility, the awareness, all the things that go with carrying a gun in the public space, uh, I would implore you to make sure you're carrying a 9mm or larger and uh, give serious consideration to a gun with a 4-inch barrel and slide set up so that you can get those rapid follow-up shots, you have a, a good enough sight radius to be able to be accurate out to the distances we were talking about before. Um, you might have to take that headshot in the extreme scenario, you might have a target behind cover, we talked about the port drill. So I, I like to see a gun with that, that you know, 3.8, some of the, the models come out in 3.8, that's fine, uh, close enough, right? But some of those really, really tiny guns are, are harder to shoot, harder to shoot quickly, and harder to be precise with. People will say, well, if you practice, sure, but why invest the extra time, effort, and energy? Why take the extra time, effort, and energy in a worst case scenario uh, event, right, if you don't have to? So if you're going to bother to carry the gun, um, get, get the right kind of gun, and then Back to the beginning of the video, which you get to watch again and rewind and take the range with you and watch on your phone. Uh, all the tips and all the things I've talked about after you've picked the appropriate gun, right? Make sure you have a good gun, good holster set up and all that stuff. Um, as always, your, your best training is going to be done, uh, especially when you're first learning, under the supervision of a, a qualified instructor. The United States Concealed Carry Association, uh, Defensive Shooting uh, Fundamentals, the DSF class, that program. Uh, sorry, I might have some of those books over here. I don't know. Uh, pulled them out for a photo op. So... Uh, look for those DSF books. They have them available now at the uh, USCCA website. You can buy the book or just go ahead and sign up for the class. There's some e-learning and then the live fire training under, supervised, uh, the, under the supervision of certified instructors that have worked under the program with me and, and our lead instructors at ICE training. Obviously, all the ICE training instructors and anybody who's teaching with the Personal Defense Network. We got a lot of firearms instructors on the tour that don't necessarily teach what I teach, right? It's close enough. I respect it. I get it. I understand it. I can explain it. And uh, I think it's really valuable. And it's always good to know what other people are teaching, right? It's not always good to go take classes from everybody if you can, but maybe just know what they're teaching. So take a look at the other instructors um, outside of our programs, my own programs um, as well, that we uh, sponsor or support uh, or we have as contributors at Personal Defense Network. Appreciate you tuning in for the live event. Um, Gold Level members, I'll see you in about 30 minutes in our uh, private armed home defense uh, review and discussion that we're going to go over that lecture. And everybody else, I'll see you online. Put the follow-up questions in the comments section. Thanks.